I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. This week, Ivory Coast. L'attitude des journalistes des médias internationaux. And the media side to a story of civil war. Egypt after Mubarak. Bloggers can still go to jail for criticizing the authorities. The same is true in Bahrain. Eight years after the fall of Saddam Hussein's statue, we'll take you inside the event and the coverage of that story. Getting to the crux of the debate over Libya in our web video of the week. This may sound familiar. An African country locked in a civil war between the ruling powers and an opposition movement featuring a UN-sanctioned military intervention led by Western forces. But this isn't Libya. We're talking about the West African country of Ivory Coast. Given everything else going on in North Africa, this story has ranked relatively low on the global news agenda. But ever since last November's elections, in which international observers say opposition leader Alassane Ouattara prevailed over President Laurent Gbagbo, the two sides have been locked in a power struggle that has turned violent. And there are some interesting media angles, including the role played by RTI, the state-owned broadcaster. Our starting point this week is Abidjan, the story of Ivory Coast and the media as a bloody war inches towards a conclusion. Political upheaval reigns in Ivory Coast with both candidates claiming to be president. The media has been at the center of the power struggle between Laurent Gbagbo and Alassane Ouattara. The president of the Republic has besoin qu'on soit mobilisé autour de lui. The Ivorian media has split into two camps. Uh, journalists, including uh, our own team from France, Van Kat, will have to leave the premises. The media was used to rally uh, forces on either side. After the votes were cast and counted in Ivory Coast, and well before the bullets and bombs started flying, there was another battle to control the narrative. And in the early stages, it was no contest. Whatever everyone else says about the election last year, the media contest was won hands down by Laurent Bagbo. That's because Laurent Bagbo controlled the commercial capital, Abidjan. He controlled the media in Abidjan. Most importantly, he controlled the state television and radio stations in Abidjan. To many Ivorians, Laurent Bagbo had won the election fair and square because their only source of information was, of course, state television. And that's why, on December 16th last year, Alassane Ouattara called on his supporters to try and storm state TV because he was aware of the influence of the state board. Since then, Alassane Ouattara has launched his own TV station, essentially a partisan station. And in the middle, we have uh, the uh, UN uh, radio station. It is reporting that Alassane Ouattara is the president-elect and calling, essentially, Laurent Gbagbo as the former president. The on-air media war is not limited to news coverage. The Bagbo-controlled RTI has been accused of an anti-Watara, anti-UN bias in its choice of what films to broadcast. They began to replay uh, the Hollywood movie Hotel Rwanda. And basically the implication was that if Alassane Ouattara uh, were brought into power by the French, by the United Nations, then there would be a genocide in Côte d'Ivoire. That the foreign influence in the conflict could lead to a major civil war. And the broadcasting of that Hollywood movie, Hotel Rwanda, was almost a warning call to Ivorians. However, two broadcasters can play at that game. So the Watara-backed TCI channel aired the German World War II film, Downfall. Its message about an infamous leader stubbornly refusing to accept defeat was about as subtle as the Rwanda film. On the print side of the Ivoirian media story, the playing field is a bit more even. The biggest newspaper, Fraternité Matin, is pro-Bagbo, but has long suffered a credibility problem. If you go back to Ivory Coast uh, history, essentially the state dominated the media, they dominated television, they dominated the main newspaper, Fraternité Matin, for, for, for decades, as a matter of fact. Anyone who's lived in that part of the world had grown increasingly cynical and disbelieving about what they were hearing from a state-controlled newspaper. So this was natural 
that the media would be played in such a way. Newspapers on both sides of the political divide report that they or their people have been attacked, and the Bagbo camp has targeted the means of distribution. Eddy Press is Ivory Coast's sole newspaper distribution company, and about two weeks ago, forces loyal to Bagbo raided Eddy Press, surrounded the premises, and blocked the distribution of newspapers favorable to Alassane Ouattara. So in response to this, the officials at Eddy Press decided not to distribute the pro-Bagbo uh, newspapers either. So no newspapers went out that day and for three days in Ivory Coast. There was also a dearth of Ivory Coast coverage in the international media. After some initial post-election attention late in 2010... The Ivory Coast has never been so close to a resumption of civil war. The global media moved on. The feeling is that if the oil is not involved, then there's no coverage. No oil, no coverage. That's one of the slogans I've been hearing. And there is a feeling that the only reason it's back on the agenda is because the Middle East protests, which have dominated news coverage in the last few months, seem to be dying down. The other thing is the UF news organizations who have been cutting down uh, their, their resources. I know that there are tough decisions to make as far as budgeting is concerned, but when budgets are cut, uh, when coverage is cut, when resources are cut, Sub-Saharan Africa has always gotten the short shrift. The French media never lost its post-colonial interest in the Ivory Coast story. They've been on it throughout. But Laurent Bagbo and his media are using the international community's backing of his opponent against his opponent. And so they would always refer to Ouattara as a French lackey, a tool of Western powers. The economic sanctions against the, the Bagbo regime were starting to, to take their toll. So the state media would explain this is Ouattara's effort by him and his French friends to starve Ivoirians to death. So you're undergoing economic privations, okay, we accept that. But it's not our fault, it's the French and it's Watara. I do remember on state television, uh, the state TV broadcasters specifically talking about foreign elements. L'attitude des journalistes des médias internationaux. Foreign journalists who had an agenda against Côte d'Ivoire, who wanted to bring civil war in Côte d'Ivoire. Politicians in trouble, be they in Abidjan, Cairo or Tripoli, have all blamed their problems on foreign media outlets that they all say have an agenda. And they have all delivered those messages on their own state-run media mouthpieces. They're either being hypocritical or ironic. Our Global Village Voice is now on Ivory Coast and the role the media are playing in that conflict. Both camps have understood that information is a weapon and it is not a hazard that one of the main targets of Guatemala's military forces was the national TV RTI, which they controlled for a few hours before being taken out by Bagbo's forces on April 1st. This first victory in Abidjan battle revived Bagbo's forces and the RTI has been used since then as an instrument of mobilization. It's not the same as the turmoil in Egypt or Libya. In State TV RTI, they're showing footage of Bagbo from the 2010 election instead of the atrocities on the streets in Abidjan or Duekue. So it's not surprising that Bagbo says foreign media is manufacturing facts. It's just a strategy to maintain power because I think he knows as long as the media continues to cover what's really going on in the region, he knows that his days in office are numbered. Time now for Listening Post News Bites. The story in Bahrain for media outlets and bloggers who continue to cover the political protests there is one of threats, intimidation and harassment. Al Wasat, an opposition newspaper, is being openly criticized by Bahrain's state news agency, BNA. The newspaper was accused of, quote, deliberate news fabrication and falsification during the recent unrest, unquote. Publication of the newspaper was then suspended and only allowed to resume after three of its top-level staff, Mansour al-Jamari, Walid Nuhid, and Akil Mirza, resigned.
Press freedom groups have criticized the arrest of dissident blogger Mohammed al Mustaki. Al Mustaki had been providing live updates on the street protests, coverage that clearly irked the Bahraini authorities. And al Mustaki is just one of the dissident bloggers in Bahrain under threat. At least two others have been arrested and are being held at unknown locations. Mahmoud al Youssef, who's known as the Bahraini blog father, was also arrested and questioned recently. He was subsequently released but only after criticism of his arrest by the U.S. State Department. These are still early days in post-Mubarak Egypt, but there are signs that the military, which is playing a key role in the transition to democracy, is no more tolerant of political dissent than the former regime was. Michael Nabil Sanad, a political activist and blogger, has been arrested after criticizing the military police. According to reports circulating in the Egyptian blogosphere, Sanad was arrested after posting a blog entry about the lack of transparency in the armed forces. Sanad has reportedly been accused of insulting the military institution and publishing false news about it. If those charges stick, he could face up to three years in jail. And conditions for journalists in Libya are getting no better. Three members of an Al Jazeera Arabic news crew have been held by the Gaddafi authorities since March 19th. The government has provided no reason for the arrest of Kamil Al-Talu, Amar Al-Hamdan and Ahmad Val Wild Eddin. A fourth Al Jazeera crew member, Lotfi Al Masudi, was taken along with the other three but released on April 3rd. And just last Thursday, Libya expelled 26 international journalists from the country. PJ Crowley, the former spokesman for the U.S. State Department, seems to be making as much news now as he was when he was in the job. Crowley was forced to resign recently after publicly stating that the Pentagon's treatment of Bradley Manning, the soldier accused of leaking classified documents to WikiLeaks, was counterproductive and a strategic error. Later, he said, he stood by those comments, and now he's departing from the Obama administration's policy once again, telling the online magazine Salon.com that he cannot see how the U.S. government can possibly prosecute WikiLeaks under American law, as it has threatened to do, without also prosecuting the site's mainstream media partners, such as the New York Times. WikiLeaks teamed up with The Times and other newspapers, including The Guardian in the UK, to maximize the impact of the revelations contained in the Afghan and Iraq war logs, as well as the release of those US diplomatic cables. The Guardian, coincidentally, has just been named Britain's Newspaper of the Year at the annual UK Press Awards. The judges said the WikiLeaks cable story put The Guardian at the top of the news headlines, and some say it will change relationships between governments and the press and public forever. The authorities in Sri Lanka are stepping up efforts against one of the country's most critical news websites. The editor of Lanka News, Banet Rupasinga, has been arrested for allegedly threatening another man. But critics are calling this just the latest move by President Mahinda Rajapaksa's government to silence the opposition site, which routinely reports on government waste and corruption. Since going online back in 2005, staff at Lanka News say they have frequently faced threats and harassment. Earlier this year, the site's office was torched in an arson attack, and one of its writers, Pragith Ekna Ligoda, has yet to be found after vanishing a year ago. Sri Lanka has a lousy record on media freedom. The latest Reporters Without Borders Index on press freedom ranks it at 158th of the 178 countries listed. On April 9, 2003, a made-for-TV event took place in the heart of Baghdad that created the impression that the Iraq War was over just a few weeks after it began. But first impressions, particularly those instantly transmitted by the modern media, can be misleading. And exactly eight years later, American forces are still in Iraq. There was something about those images, though. The fall of Saddam Hussein, symbolized by the toppling of his statue in Firdos Square, and the crowd of Iraqis celebrating the event that said mission accomplished. Many analysts have since suggested that the event was a masterful piece of wartime propaganda that the media simply swallowed. But earlier this year, journalist Peter Moss of the New Yorker magazine investigated what really happened on that day. And what he found wasn't a skilled military manipulation of the news media, but more of a perfect storm of circumstance and imagery. The Listening Post's Jason Mohican now on the day the statue fell and why the story played the way it did. Days before the March 2003 bombing of Iraq, U.S. Vice President Dick Cheney gave television audiences a snapshot of what he thought the American-led invasion would look like. I really do believe we will be greeted as liberators. 
words that evoked images of the Allied victory in World War II. On April 9, 2003, Cheney got his Kodak moment. What I think is really important about what happened with the media coverage on April 9th is that it signaled to Americans not only that the war was over, but that we, if you will, had won. The mission was not accomplished, but the celebratory scenes of the fall of Saddam Hussein, or at least his likeness, gave that impression. But appearances can be deceiving. Though there were few people in the square, a disproportionate number of them were journalists. You know, if there's one journalist in a crowd of 100 or a crowd of 500, okay. One journalist is not going to affect what 500 people do. But if there are 50 or 100 journalists surrounding 20 or 30 Iraqis, most likely they are going to affect what those Iraqis are doing. And to the millions of people watching this on television, it looked and sounded big. There he goes. And the images were broadcast over and over and over again. Cette image de libération. Creating a visual shorthand for victory. Which, of course, cements it as an iconic image. CNN, for instance, the image of the statue falling is replayed once every about seven and a half minutes from noon until 8 p.m. East Coast time in America. And on Fox, that's every four and a half minutes. And so what we see is just this constant image of the statue toppling that made this moment seem like the end of a war. And what we see right away, just looking at the week before April 9th and the week after April 9th, is that coverage of the war itself declines precipitously across the networks. The idea was to show people, first of all, that the U.S. is in control of Baghdad, and second, that the Iraqis are happy about it. And this is exactly why this image was played over and over and over again. This is Operation Iraqi Freedom. 24-hour news is a giant echo chamber. And when you introduce something that is a partial truth or a myth, it bounces around this echo chamber and creates a universal truth that people accept. Chasing down the nuance and chasing down what actually really happened and what was the mood takes a long time. It can take years. Although millions of people around the world saw this event unfold on live television in 2003, many have never shaken the idea that something about it just wasn't quite right. That it was not entirely a grassroots effort was painfully obvious to anyone who... It was a little bit too convenient. This statue just so happened to be located at the square where the hotel that housed foreign journalists was also located. And that hotel, the Palestine, happened to be one of three locations where journalists were killed just a day earlier after coming under fire from U.S. forces. In the documentary Control Room, Al Jazeera's Dima Khatib saw a connection between those events. It was a very clever idea what they did, of course. They did it on purpose. They knew they were coming to the square where all the journalists were, where everybody was going to be live and was going to forget everything else that they had done. They, they were going to forget 24 hours what had happened. My colleague from Reuters, I think, asked you whether you knew that the Palestine hotel was a center for journalists. Could you just confirm that you did? Everybody in the world, the media, was covering the attacks on journalists instead of covering what was actually happening on the ground outside that area where journalists uh, were staying. So when on the 9th of April, the US forces do enter Fergo Square, we didn't really know how that had happened. and. There was no way we could find that. Ordinary Iraqis gathered here. This statue is going to be brought crashing down. A lot of people have assumed that this was some kind of masterful psychological operation planned by the military to manipulate the media. That's a notion that Peter Moss, who was embedded with the Marines, rejects. It was the journalists, actually, who were responsible for creating this event, not the military, because I was with those Marines that actually took down the statue. I knew that on the morning that they headed into central Baghdad, that they had no idea there was a statue at Firdos Square. They hadn't heard of Firdos Square. So I knew that the initial and still existing criticism that it was staged by the military, planned in advance, wasn't true. 
What happened is, as the day wore on and the sense of inevitable euphoria developed amongst the small number of people that were there, they wanted to show and you know, uh, demonstrate that they realized that this incredible moment had arrived. And the most obvious thing that was there in front of them was this statue. There were two key moments when the military presence at Firdo Square contributed to precipitated what happened. And the first moment was when, at the very beginning, a gunnery sergeant gave a sledgehammer and a stretch of rope to a very small number of Iraqis who were in Firdo Square. Iraqis tried to topple the statue themselves. The Iraqis go at it with the sledgehammer, they go at it with the rope, and the media gathers around, and that encourages them to go at it even more with the sledgehammer and the rope, and it's being broadcast live. And then the battalion commander makes the decision, okay, we're going to bring down that statue now. Because if it remains standing with it being broadcast, it's going to be a symbol of resistance to the American invasion. The U.S. Marine captain went up to the tank recovery vehicle and started barking orders at him. The driver came out, took his helmet off, and literally that far away from the the Marines said, "Because um, he said, worse the effect of because if if this is going to be on live television, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to damn well do it right." So it was amazing how conscious these American soldiers were of the Kodak moment. It was a moment that the reporters who had been holed up in the Palestine Hotel, afraid to leave after the attack a day earlier, were not going to miss. When you look at all the video and you look at all the pictures, you can see how a myth is created. The pictures are mother's milk of TV. And this was a hell of a picture. But it was a picture that betrayed the reality of what was still to come. The Battle of Firdos Square was won with a military-grade tow truck and the help of the media. But the war was far from over. More Global Village voices now on the statue and what the world made of that story. The statue of Saddam was a symbol uh, that they targeted specifically because uh, they knew that the, uh, the media was residing right, right next to that roundabout where the statue was. And so I believe they just wanted a um, dramatic moment to what they thought would be the end of the war. The media, and especially Al Jazeera, did not do this event justice. Instead of focusing on what this meant for the people of Iraq, they decided to argue on whether this was a spontaneous outburst of emotion from the people or a staged photo opportunity for the US Army. History is filled with iconic moments. The American media had hoped that the toppling of the statue of Saddam Hussein would become one of these moments, a moment which symbolized the liberation of the Iraqi people, ushering in a new era of peace and democracy. The reality, however, has been far different, and violence has continued for years, long outliving the media's desire to cover it. Finally, last week when we first saw that viral video of those 17-month-old twin boys from Brooklyn, New York, talking to each other without the benefit of words, we considered running it as our web video of the week. It's got more than 15 million views on YouTube. But we decided to wait, because we figured it was only a matter of time before somebody subtitled the entire thing and then used the video to make some kind of political point. We did not have to wait long. We've since seen versions in which the twins debate American politics and April Fool's jokes, but the one that we settled on has to do with the military intervention in Libya, just in case the toddlers added anything to the debate. We'll see you next time at the Listening Post.